Welcome to Dermatology Explained. Today's video presentation is part 7 of our video series on autoimmune bullous diseases. We will be focusing on paraneoplastic pemphigus. Just as a reminder, what are the pemphigus blistering diseases? Pemphigus is characterized by an intraepidermal split in the skin. Pemphigus is derived from the Greek word pemphix, which means blister or bubble. It can be categorized into six groups. This includes Pemphigus vulgaris, of which there are variants including the reactive form, Pemphigus vegetans. The next second group is Pemphigus foliaceus. There is an endemic variant known as Fogo selvagum, as well as a lupus-like variant known as Pemphigus erythromatosus. The third group is IgA Pemphigus. The fourth group, which includes Paraneoplastic Pemphigus, and that's the focus of today's presentation. There's also drug-induced Pemphigus as well as hepatiform pemphigus. These are the six broad groups under the umbrella of the pemphigus blistering diseases. And again, just to remind ourselves, if you've seen our previous videos in this series, you would have seen the schematic before, which demonstrates the epidermis, the dermal epidermal junction, as well as the dermis. And if we zoom up on the epidermis, we can see that between the keratinocytes, there are junctions, essentially proteins, which help the keratinocytes bind together. In the epidermis, the key ones include desmoglein 1 and 3, desmocolin, but there's also other ones such as placophyllin, placoglobin, periplacon, as well as envoplacon and desmoplacon. In paraneoplastic pemphigus, the target antigens include desmoglains, plectin, placons, desmoplacons, envoplacon, periplacon, as well as bullous pemphigus antigen 1 which is a component of the dermal epidermal junction, hemidesmosomes. For paraneoplastic pemphigus, the, it is the placons which are more specific to this condition. And we'll speak more about this in a later slide. In terms of an overview of paraneoplastic pemphigus, it was initially reported in 1990 by Dr. Anhalt et al. They first described paraneoplastic pemphigus as having recalcitrant blistering, erosive mucocutaneous lesions, and an associated neoplasm with high titers of pemphigus-like anti-cell surface autoantibodies. It was later realized that the cutaneous lesions can be polymorphous, meaning it can have different morphologies, resembling those of pemphigus vulgaris, bullous pemphigoi, erythema multiforme, graft versus host disease, or lichen planus. It is a rare autoimmune disease, which is IgG-mediated bullous disease with autoantibodies that react with components of predominantly the desmosomes. It is almost always associated with confirmed occult malignancy. They typically present with painful, extensive mucosal as well as, muc as, well as cutaneous lesions. And as already emphasized, they may have varying different morphologies, ranging from flaccid blisters to widespread lichenoid eruptions. These patients overall have a poor prognosis. There can be extensive epidermal loss, which can lead to extreme dehydration, protein depletion, infection risk, and they may often need intensive care. The majority of cases of paraneoplastic pemphigus reported are in the age group of 45 to 70 years of age. Two thirds of patients present with paraneoplastic pemphigus with an existing underlying malignancy or neoplasm, whereas one third of cases, the neoplasm is detected after the presentation of the paraneoplastic pemphigus. What sort of conditions are associated with paraneoplastic pemphigus? There are a number of malignant diseases, including non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 40% of the time, CLL 20% of the time, most commonly presents two to three years after the diagnosis of CLL. Two thirds of neoplasms precede paraneoplastic pemphigus. Water shown macroglobulinemia is associated in 1% of the time. Other associations include sarcoma and carcinoma. It is also associated with a number of more benign conditions, including Castleman's disease 20% of the time, which is a lymphoproliferative disease associated with enlarged lymph nodes, fevers, as well as HHV8 virus infection. Castleman's disease is the most common cause in children. It is also associated with thymoma, but generally speaking, Castleman's disease is more common compared to thymoma in terms of an association with paraneoplastic pemphigus. In terms of the underlying pathophysiology, paraneoplastic pemphigus involves IgG1 autoantibodies against components of the desmosome and some hemidesmosomes as well. And predominantly, periplacon and envoplacon is most specific 
for this condition. However, the target antigens can include desmoglein 1 and 3. Note these are the ones that are targeted in Pervigus foliaceus and Pervigus vulgaris. Bullis pervigoid antigen 1, or BP230, this is also a target in Bullis pervigoid. Envoplacin, periplacin, desmoplacin 1 and 2, plectin, and in rare cases, laminin 332 as well. As you can see, there's a wide range of targets in paraneoplastic pervigus, and this probably explains why there are multiple differing morphologies in terms of the mucocutaneous presentation. In terms of underlying genetics, those who have HLA alleles HLA DRB103, as well as HLA CW14, are at higher risk of having paraneoplastic pervigus. In terms of the mechanism of disease, three key mechanisms have been hypothesized. One is an immune response against tumor antigens, which leads to a crust reaction, and hence the body will then develop a response against normal epithelial proteins in a process called mimicry or mimicry. Another mechanism includes the tumor inducing cytokine dysregulation, which leads to autoantibodies. And a third mechanism includes a tumor inducing a cell mediated lichenoid interface dermatitis that uncovers previously hidden antigens in a process known as epitope spreading. In terms of the clinical features, we can divide this into mucosal and mucocutaneous or cutaneous. In terms of mucosal, generally speaking, most cases of pyroneoplastic pemphigus will be associated with stomatitis. If your patient or case does not have stomatitis, it's important to consider other potential differentials. Mucosal presentation includes intractable stomatitis extending onto the vermilion lip border. Widespread mucosal involvement is common, and the tongue is most commonly involved, including the lateral tongue. In terms of cutaneous findings, these include flaccid or tense bullae, erythematous macules, erythema multiforme like lesions, lichenoid papules, and the palms and soles are the most commonly located areas affected. Here are some images from some key textbooks demonstrating some features of paraneoplastic pervigus. We can see here these, image, these images demonstrate significant recalcitrant oral stomatitis. On the top right hand side, this demonstrates some lichenoid lesions in a patient with paraneoplastic pervigus. And on the bottom, there are further images demonstrating stomatitis and oral involvement. As you can see, there are multiple morphologies of the lesions associated with autoimmune disease. These are some further images demonstrating the various morphologies seen in paraneoplastic pemphigus. There are other organs that can be involved in this condition as well. In terms of the eye, severe pseudomembranous conjunctivitis, scarring, as well as obliteration of conjunctival cornices, similar to mucous membrane pemphigoid. There is also ENT and gastrointestinal involvement, as well as the nasopharyngeal, esophageal, and duodenal lesions. In terms of the lung, some patients get bronchiolitis obliterans, which can result in respiratory failure. It is only detected on pulmonary function testing in early disease, so it's important to consider testing for this, and you would see an obstructive picture. Imaging will demonstrate airspace trapping, and in late presentation cases, there's often shortness of breath or dyspnea that is out of proportion with imaging findings. There may also be lesional involvement of the vaginal, penile, or perianal areas. Here are some further images to demonstrate paraneoplastic pemphigus. We can see here there, are, there can be a pemphigus-like presentation with distributed crusted erosions on the trunk. In some cases, you can get hemorrhagic blisters on the palms. You can also get a lichen planus-like or lichenoid presentation as seen on the top right hand side. There are multiple eroded papules and plaques that often heal with hyperpigmentation on the palms. And you can see crusted oral lesions and ulcers on the lips and tongue, as well as erosions on the glands of the penis. In terms of investigations, so skin biopsy finding can be variable depending on which cutaneous lesion is biopsied. It can demonstrate superbasilar acanthalysis sub epidermal clefting is possible. It can demonstrate an interface dermatitis, particularly with the lichenoid lesions. Lichenoid dermatitis with vacuolar degeneration and sebat bodies. There can also be a lymphocytic infiltrate. Direct immunofluorescence demonstrates intercellular chicken wire pattern, as well as linear IgG and C3 on the basement membrane zone on rat bladder sample. 
Pemphigus erythromatosus may also have a similar pattern. Indirect immunofluorescence may be positive in both stratifying simple and transitional epithelia, as well as stratifying epithelia. Here are some histological images demonstrating some findings in perineoplastic pemphigus. On the top left-hand side, this histological image, image demonstrates suprabasal acanthalysis. And on the right-hand side, we can see an interface dermatitis with scattered dyskeratotic cells. On the bottom, this is indirect immunofluorescence studies, where we can see IgG deposition on the intercellular spaces of keratinocytes on the bottom left, as well as on the dermal epidermal junction on the bottom right. And the target tissue used in these examples is rat bladder epithelium. Here is another histological image from the Bologna textbook, which demonstrates areas of suprabasilar acanthalysis, as well as an interface dermatitis with basal cell vacuolar changes, necrotic keratinocytes and lymphocytes within the epidermis. In terms of the investigations, we can further confirm the diagnosis with pemphigus pemphigoid antibody testing and use the TARDIS to monitor disease activity. As mentioned before, targets include desmoglein 1, desmoglein 3, bullis pemphigus antigen 1, envoplacan, periplacan, desmoplacan 1 and 2, as well as plectin. It's important to exclude infections as well. These include swabs to exclude HSV, primary or secondary infection. The extent can be assessed using pulmonary function tests to determine whether there's any lung function issues, as well as high resolution CT scanning. It's important to look for any associations with other malignancies and perform pretreatment screening. This includes full blood count and film, liver function testing, electrolyte, urea creatinine testing, calcium magnesium phosphate, EPG and IEPG, serum free light chains, urine, Benz Jones protein, flow cytometry, LDH. In conjunction with hematology, one can consider core biopsy of the lymph nodes as well as bone marrow biopsy. CT imaging of the neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis as well as PET scan will be useful for determining any other sources of malignancy. Age-appropriate malignancy screening, of course, is important. And one can consider immunosuppression screening prior to treatment. In terms of differential diagnoses, these would be relevant to the bullous and lichenoid elements seen in perineoplastic pemphigus. And this includes pemphigus vulgaris, mucous membrane pemphigoid, linear IgA, epidermolysis bullosa acquisita, bullus lupus, and lichen planus pemphigoides. Erythema multiforme major, Seaman Johnson syndrome, and toxic epidermal necrolysis is also in the differential. Generalized fixed drug eruption, as well as graft versus host disease, as well as generalized viral infections such as HSV and visa V. In terms of the management, it's important with cases of potential cases of perineoplastic pemphigus to organize for urgent admission, as well as hematology review and referral. It's important to manage these patients in a multidisciplinary team setting with a psychologist, respiratory team, ophthalmology team, ENT, and hematology review as appropriate. Manage potential pain symptoms with analgesia. Supportive care should be done to, take, to assist with care of the eyes, mouths, and genital areas. It's important to find and treat the underlying neoplasia. Generally, these may take slow to resolve, and in some cases, incomplete to resolve, except for Castleman's disease and benign thymoma, where excision may often result in resolution of the pemphigus lesion six to 18 months afterwards. For underlying non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, this may be treated with rituximab. Oral and systemic treatment for perineoplastic pemphigus should be done in conjunction with a hematology team, and options include oral steroids, steroid sparing agents, including methotrexate, cyclosporine, azathioprine, myco phenylate, mercator, and dapsone, although these generally have limited evidence for efficacy in perineoplastic pemphigus. And thirdly, intravenous IVIG, rituximab, and plasma exchange are also treatment options. In terms of the prognosis for perineoplastic pemphigus, it is generally considered poor. Stomatitis is often recalcitrant to treatment, except in instances where the underlying issue is benign neoplasm. Hematological malignancies are common, A TEN-like presentation or bullous pemphigoid-like presentation may occur. And one of the main complications include bronchiolitis obliterans, which affects the lung, and 30 to 90% of patients have been reported to have this. Thank you for joining us on our video tour of perineoplastic pemphigus. We hope you found this video informative and useful. If you're interested in 
listening to our other videos on other autoimmune bullous diseases, please check out our YouTube channel on Dermatology Explained. We have a video playlist on a series called Autoimmune Bullous Diseases, and we hope to catch up with you next time on Dermatology Explained. Thank you.